Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to our symposium. Uh, a little introduction of myself. Um, so my name is Jiang Ren, or you can call me Caroline. And I'm a third year PhD student in cognitive psychology at the University of Pittsburgh. And I'm working with Melissa Lipters. And my research focuses on uh, using both behavioral and neuroimaging techniques, uh, such as fMRI, to understand the neural basis of math cognition. So today, uh, we will have three presenters. Uh, Dr. Press, Dr. Brenner, and me. So we will be talking about using different neuroimaging techniques to understand the neural basis for number processing and the math skills. So Dr. Press will be the first presenter, and Dr. Press is a uh, is an associate professor and, at Vanderbilt University, and he has done incredible works in using both behavioral and brain imaging techniques to understand how human brain represents and processes numbers and numerical information and how they relate to learning of math skills. So we are very honored to have Dr. Press here today. And Dr. Press, uh, please take it away. Thank you very much, that's very flattering. <laughs> All right, so um, I'm gonna talk to you about work that we've been doing in my lab looking at this question of how does the brain know a number is a number? And um, first, sorry, I'll click on that one. First, just want to acknowledge the collaborators in this work and the funding sources. So I don't think I need to convince anyone in this society that numbers are an important thing to study, but I think it's useful to reflect on the many ways in which we encounter numbers in our everyday lives. So in academic context, you know, things like word problems and calculation skills, you know, we encounter a lot of Arabic digits. And, um, but even in the outside world, things like bank statements, bus timetables, prescription labels, you know, these things convey a huge amount of information via Arabic digits. Um, and so it's an interesting thing to think about. So one of the first things that has to happen when you process any of that information <clears throat> is that the brain has to realize or decide that some of the things that you're seeing are numbers and some are other things such as letters. And I believe that this process, the, the fluency and efficiency with which this process occurs is an important dimension of individual differences that is relevant for the uh, acquisition of math skills. So the question then is, how does the brain perform this process of distinguishing Arabic digits from other symbols? Well, symbolic numbers are a relatively recent invention. We can see first evidence for them around 40,000 years ago. Positional number systems have only been evident for a few thousand years, while the Hindu Arabic numerals that we use today really weren't widespread in any sense until around the 11th century. So when you put that 40,000 years against the timeline of evolution of the human brain, which takes place over the course of hundreds of thousands or millions of years, it's clear that the brain has not had time to evolve innate dedicated systems for the processing and representation of Arabic digits or symbolic numbers. And so like many other symbols, um, an idea put forward by Dehain and Dehain and Cohen is then that pre-existing brain architecture must be recycled or co-opted for processing these symbols. So this is the neuronal recycling hypothesis. So what systems might we look to that might be recycled for this purpose. So we know that um, in the ventral visual stream of the brain, the ventral pathway and the uh, temporal lobe is involved in the visual processing of objects. And importantly, areas within this cortex specialize for processing object categories, such as faces in the fusiform face area or body parts or places and importantly, even orthographic stimuli such as words. The triple code model put forward by Dehane and elaborated by Dehane and Cohen in 95 suggests that in addition to magnitude code in the parietal lobe and verbal code in the left language areas, 
there is a visual number form code in that ventral visual stream in the inferior temporal lobe. And that areas in the left and right are involved perhaps slightly differently in the processing of Arabic digits. So like many other aspects of the triple code model, this idea has received validation in the subsequent literature um, in cool work using cortical stimulation to interfere with uh, symbol processing. Rue al showed that a region in the inferior temporal gyrus selectively impaired Arabic numeral processing. Shum et al using intracranial electrophysiological recordings showed an area in the right inferior temporal gyrus that responded more to numerals versus other symbols. And then in terms of neuroimage, uh, neuroimaging of uh, non-invasive, the Grotera al using a one-back task have shown that numbers, stronger response to numbers than other symbol categories and objects in that inferior temporal gyrus region. And Amaric and Dehane showed a stronger response in that region compared to a range of other stimuli. And interestingly, that difference was even stronger for mathematicians, which was kind of a cool finding. So we, we did a meta-analysis led by Darren Yeo, my former graduate student, looking at what could we see convergent evidence across the literature for such a um, inferior temporal number areas. So we looked at all fMRI studies that compared Arabic numerals with some other symbols, and we found convergent region in that right inferior temporal gyrus, in addition to some other canonical sort of number areas, I'm sorry. Um, so it does appear that the, there is a kind of spatial consistency or convergence across the literature here. More recently, with my former postdoc, Courtney Pollock, we did an fMRI study testing the hypothesis that the response of this region to digits depends on attention to number. So in this study, we asked participants to decide, is there a digit present amongst a string of letters, yes or no? And then the second condition, is there a letter present amongst a string of digits, yes or no? And what we find when we contrast the present versus absent conditions is that we see digit preferring activity in a region in the left inferior temporal gyrus and a non-overlapping but proximal region that responds preferentially to letters. So again, support for this inferior temporal numeral area. However, when we contrast just the absent conditions, so the string of digits and a string of letters, when those are not the things you're looking for, we did not see activation in this region, which suggests that just seeing these visual forms is not enough to activate this region, which is why we've started calling it a numeral area rather than a form area. So if just the number form, is not enough to activate this region if just being exposed to the shape is not enough. What information does this area care about? So in a study led by Darren Yeo, we used three independent data sets um, from different samples, different scanners, but all with the same task, which was a passive viewing task in which participants saw a string of a sequence of symbols and had to press a button when the hash, this sort of red hash mark. And the symbols could be digits, letters, or scrambled digits or letters. And we used um, representational similarity analysis, which is a multi-voxel pattern analysis technique that allows us to look at the spatial geometry of activation as opposed to average activation levels. And what we did was to tech compare or uh, our the spatial activation patterns in this ITG numeral area from the meta-analysis with a series of candidate models. So if shape is the thing that this region cares about, then our data should fit the shape model best. If it cares about familiar things versus unfamiliar things, it should fit the familiar versus novel model the best and so on. What we found is that um, in the left ITG area, our data didn't fit any of the models well. But in the right, 
we found good evidence for the alphanumeric versus novel, letters versus numbers versus novel, and numbers versus everything else. So the three kind of categorical models. We did not find evidence for the shape model, which again suggests that this is not, I think, a number form area per se. So just to put it more simply, the three models that we found good evidence for are those that distinguish digits from other things at the categorical level. So um, I said at the beginning, I think that the function of this region and this process of distinguishing digits from other symbols is an important dimension of individual differences and relates to math skills. So to begin testing this, in the study with Courtney Pollock, we correlated digit specific activity with calculation skills from the Woodcock Johnson battery across the whole brain. And what we found was a positive correlation in the right inferior temporal gyrus area, whereby those individuals who showed a stronger response to digits in this area showed higher calculation skills. And interestingly, this area overlaps almost exactly with the area from the meta-analysis that Darren Yeo did. So um, again, like quite strong spatial consistency across studies and across contexts. And this really suggests to me that there is a functionally relevant role for the response of this region in the development of math skills. Importantly, there was no similar correlation between letter activity and calculation skills, suggesting it is specific to math. Also using that same data, we used um, multivoxel pattern analysis to look at the representation of digits. And we found that individuals with higher calculation skills showed a more distinct representation of individual, difference, uh, individual digits in the left I, uh, ITNA, but not the right. So those individuals who, for whom the representation of three, for example, was very different from four, and four was very different from five and three and so on, those individuals with that more distinct representation of individual numbers were better at calculation in the left ITNA, but those individuals who had a stronger overall response in the right were better at calculation, which suggests some potential uh, interesting differences between the two hemispheres. But overall, it does again suggest a functionally relevant role for this uh, process. So um, we've seen this kind of interesting, I, and for me, honestly, surprising kind of spatial consistency across studies and samples and so on. So it leads us to the question of what drives the ITNA specialization? Like, why does it localize in this area so consistently? And so to begin addressing this in a study led by Ben Conrad, my former graduate student, we um, have used diffusion weighted imaging data and a method called streamlined tractography, um, in which we look at white matter projections from a given region of interest. And what we did here was we looked at, we compared the white matter projections from the left and right ITNA regions and the left letter region from the Pollock and Price study, as well as uh, looking at functional connectivity through beta series correlations. What we find is that when you look at the left ITNA versus the, so the left numeral area versus the left letter area, in terms of structural connectivity, the new numeral areas show stronger projections to a wide range of areas, including frontal and inferior parietal areas, while the letter area shows stronger projections to the occipital lobe. In terms of functional connectivity, the digit area shows stronger coupling with frontal areas and the, in, and the angular gyrus, while the letter area shows stronger coupling with language areas and the parietal lobe and occipital lobe. When we compare the left versus the right ITNA regions, in terms of structural connectivity, 
The left shows stronger projections to the left inferior frontal gyrus, namely Broca's area, while the right shows stronger projections to this kind of occipital temporal parietal junction area. The, in terms of functional connectivity, the digit area, the left shows stronger coupling with the angular gyrus, while the right shows stronger coupling with the intraparietal sulcus. So here, I think you can see this really kind of interesting hemispheric difference where the left is projecting to this kind of language word area, Broca's area, and we've seen that it's in, has is sort of related to individual representation of digits, suggesting that on the left, this ITNA might be involved in connecting digits with their verbal labels, while on the right, this stronger coupling with the right intraparietal sulcus, which as we know is a kind of magnitude area, suggests that the right ITNA may be more involved in mapping digits to their um, quantity reference. And in fact, that is exactly what the triple code model predicted um, so long ago. So um, I hope I've shown you that there are two ITNA regions, inferior temporal numeral areas in the low, uh, inferior temporal cortex that preferentially process digits, that the function, the response profiles of these regions and representation is relevant from the acquisition of math skills and that their structure and functional connectivity profiles are different and provide insights into their potential functions. So again, thanks to my uh, collaborators and funding sources and thanks for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Press, for this uh, great talk. So any questions for Dr. Press, you can uh, either type in the chat or admit yourself. Okay, no questions. Okay, so I guess we will uh, leave uh, uh, more time uh, at the very end for a broader discussion. So I will be the next uh, presenter. Um, so I'm just gonna... Start. Okay, so hello everyone. Today I'm very happy to present our work titled the neural basis for number processing and its relation to individual differences in adult uh, mathematical skills. We use numbers every day from recognizing the time to solve complicated math problems. Numbers play an important role in everyone's life. Numbers can be represented in different formats. For example, we can understand their rep numerals which is defined uh, as the uh, visual code. And we can communicate using number words, which is defined as the verbal code. We can also estimate the number of candidates, even without counting, counting them, which is defined as the semantic code. We also can use our hands to indicate a number, which is defined as the menu code. So we might ask, how does the human brain represent those different number codes? And the neuroimaging studies have found different brain regions for each of these uh, number codes. For example, based on previous findings, the parietal lobe, especially the IPS, has been found to be involved in processing the semantic number code. The classic language areas, such as the angular gyrus, superior temporal gyrus, and the medial temporal gyrus, um, they, are, they have been found, uh, they are involved in representing the verbal code. And the inferior temporal gyrus uh, for the visual code representation, and the pre-central gyrus has been found for many code representations. However, there are some limitations in earlier studies. First of all, there's a lack of studies that have investigated 
the four number codes all together. Secondly, it is unclear how different number representations in the human, in the human brain relate to individual differences in math abilities. So these limitations kind of motivated our current study. <clears throat> so therefore, the goals of our study are twofold. Firstly, to broadly characterize the underlying neural representations for the visual, verbal, manual, and the, semant and the semantic codes. And secondly, and more importantly, to investigate if there are any relations between individual differences in the underlying number representations and their math abilities. So there are 89 part adult participants in our study. And for the FMI section, there are two types of stimuli. First one is single digit wrap numeral. The other one is hand images. And the participants were required to complete two different tasks. A semantic task, uh, one from the question could be, is the number greater than seven? And a robot task, such as Simpson S5. Therefore, this two by two design generated four different conditions, visual semantic, manual semantic, visual verbal, and a manual verbal. So to reiterate what we want to do in our study, now we have four different number codes. Next, we would like to identify the brain regions supporting each of the four number codes. In particular, we want to examine the contrast for those uh, four number codes. The, sti oh, sorry. the stimulus contrast, visual versus uh, manual, and the task contrast, semantic versus verbal tasks. So after we identify those brain regions, we also wanted to investigate how does the uh, how does the brain activation in those brain regions relate to adults' uh, individual differences in math abilities. So in our study, we use a block design with a total of six runs. Each run has six, uh, has eight blocks, two blocks for each of the four conditions, and then within each block. A prompt question was given first and followed by three trials of the same condition. Participants' math and language abilities were tested in a separate behavioral session using the Woodcock Johnson test, which includes five subtests. Three of them are about math abilities calculation, math fluency, and applied problems. Calculation, which, uh, which requires participants to solve. Um, math problems such as uh, arithmetic, geometry, etc. And the math fluency, it requires participants to solve uh, simple addition, sub uh, subtraction, and multiplication problems. Applied problems, participants will need to select relevant information, recognize procedures, and perform necessary calculations to solve math problem, uh, to solve the math uh, issues. And the other two, the other two tasks are about language skills, word identification, and word attack. Word identification, it requires participants to identify letters and verbally read individual words correctly. And the word, word attack requires participants to first identify and produce sounds for single letters and the verbally read aloud the non words of letter combinations. So for the imaging data, we conducted a uh, univariate analysis with the two general linear models to investigate the two contrasts for each participant. One is the uh, stimulus contrast, uh, which is the visual uh, versus money, and then one contrast is the task contrast, which is semantic versus verbal. And to ensure the reliability and the robustness of our results, we divided our 89 participants into two groups with balanced math abilities. And within each group, we performed a 3D t-test in AFNI and I selected the voxels that pass a uh, significant threshold. Similarly for the uh, cluster selection. Then we identified the overlapping regions across two groups 
and I save them for data analysis. So for the behavioral session, we conducted a principal component analysis PCA. Specifically, for the five behavioral measurements, calculation, math fluency, applied problems, word identification, word attack, we submitted them to a principal component analysis or data dimensionality reduction. Two principal components with eigenvalues larger than one were selected. And the composite scores for those two principal components were calculated based on each variable's corresponding loading. Then we run Pearson correlations brain, between the brain activation of each brain region and a composite score of each principal component. And here are the results for the univariate analysis. So for the manual code, which is hand uh, greater than arachnoid numeral. We identified brain regions, including visual cortex, uh, middle frontal gyrus, right inferior frontal gyrus, and left posterior cingulate gyrus. I put in a separate, uh, separate figure here, which may not be easy to see from this one. For the visual code, which is the arachnoid numeral greater than the hand contrast, we identified a post-central gyrus. For the semantic code, which is the semantic task greater than the verbal task, we found brain regions including left and right lingual gyrus, left and middle occipital gyrus, left and right insula, left and right post-central gyrus. So lastly, for the verbal code, which is verbal task greater than the semantic task, we also identified a bunch of brain regions, including left middle frontal gyrus, left middle temporal gyrus, right superior frontal sulcus, left prekinis, right cerebellum, right and left uh, thalamus, Red inferior frontal gyrus, red medial frontal gyrus, and left singular gyrus. And here are the principal component analysis results. So we obtained the two principal components. And the X axis are the five measurements of math and language skills, applied problems, calculation, math fluency word attack, word identification, and the y-axis are their contributions. And the red dash line indicates the expected average contribution of each variable. Since we have five variables, five measurements, so the expected contribution for each variable is 20%. So from these figures, we can see that for the first uh, principal component, math abilities have larger contribution to a first principal component. And language skills have greater contribution to the second principal component. And here are the results for the brain behavioral correlational analysis. So for the hand greater than a numeral contrast, we found brain activations in brain regions, including visual cortex, and uh, red posterior frontal gyrus significantly correlate with the first PC. Remember the first PC that math abilities have greater contribution, so which represents participants' uh, math abilities. Also for this contrast, that hand greater than rep numeral, we also found there is a significant correlation between brain activation in left posterior singular gyrus and a, and a participant's math ability, uh, which is the first principal component. For the semantic greater than verbal task, we found brain, region, uh, brain activation in left postcentral gyrus can be a significant, a significant predictor of participant's math ability. And lastly, 
for the verbal greater than the semantic task contrast reactivation in the left thalamus <clears throat> can be a significant predictor of partisan somatability. <clears throat> so <clears throat> to sum up, we use a novel uh, number code localizer task and for the sets of brain regions supporting each number code. For example, we found uh, inferior frontal gyrus, middle temporal gyrus that are involved in representing the verbal code, which is also consistent with their earlier findings. And for the semantic code, we identified uh, post central gyrus, which is uh, kind of next to IPS. And IPS has been found for uh, semantic represent representations in earlier findings. Our findings also supported the multi constitutional nature of number representations in the human brain. And more importantly, we found that uh, brain activations uh, in brain regions such as left, po left postcentral gyrus and left thalamus are predictive of participants' uh, math abilities, which also furthers our understanding of the neural uh, cognitive architecture underlying number processing and its relation to individual differences in math achievement. So I'd like to thank uh, all the uh, members of our project, Richard, Taylor, Griff, Corey, and all the, all the lab, lab members for their help. Yeah, that's it. So any questions? I had a, a question. Um, yeah. Do you think that the the different in terms of the hand versus uh, Arabic numeral uh, contrast? Mm -hmm. do, do you think that the difference in the sort of amount of visual stimulation between mm -hmm. those conditions played a role in? Because it it looked like in your, if I remember right, yeah, there was like a lot more activation there centered around the visual cortex, right? So mm -hmm. I think that it's related just to the fact that there's more visual information in those stimuli. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I yeah, I think I agree with you. I think definitely there are some like visual information involved um, in uh, like hand and uh, uh, greater than rapid numeral contrast that uh, kind of result in this like larger visual cortex activation in uh, for this contrast. So uh, yeah, I definitely agree that uh, there might be some like visual input for this uh, hand versus uh, rapid numeral contrast. Thanks. Yeah. So if there are no any other questions, so I'm gonna, uh, so Dr. Brenner, if you would like to go ahead and share your screen. Okay, so Dr. Brenner is a uh, senior postdoc in electrical biomedical engineering and computer engineering. And currently he's working at Educational Neuroscience Group at the University of Graz in Austria. Dr. Brenner has done incredible amount of work using cutting edge data analysis tools such as motion learning mechanism and brain computer interface to understand the neural substrate of number processing and arithmetic. Dr. Brenner is also a maintainer and a developer of MNE and MNE Lab, which is a graphical user interface for processing EEJ data. And he has also contributed numerous open source object, uh, projects such as sklearn, scipy, mapplotlib. Those are also my favorite packages in Python. So um, Dr. Brenner, we are very honored to have Dr. Brenner here today to give us this talk. So um, Dr. Brenner, Brenner, you can take it away. Yeah, thank you for the nice introduction. Um, so I would like to talk about a recent EEG study that we conducted with uh, children. Um, and that was uh, the best uh, title we could uh, come up with. So 
it's, it's the study is called oscillatory EEG pa patterns of ar arithmetic problem solving in fourth graders. So obviously I'm gonna be talking about an EEG study um, for a change. Um, I also have a very short introduction. Um, so we're not uh, only focusing on basic number processing, but we want to take a look at the, you know, like next level, basically, um, arithmetic. So arithmetic is also a very important mathematical skill in everyday life. Um, here you can see, I don't know if you can see it, but um, arithmetic is uh, basically those uh, four operations plus um, minus times and divided by. Um, and there have been numerous studies uh, on arithmetic with children, with uh, adolescents and with adults. And one of the key findings um, of all of these studies or many studies is that people use two major strategies to solve arith arithmetic problems. First, fact retrieval. So, which means that um, you just retrieve the solution to a problem from a uh, long-term memory. And second, um, procedural strategy. This means that you have to uh, use um, a certain sequence of steps to get to the solution. Oops, sorry. Um, not all of those uh, studies have included neurophysiology, neurophysi um, but let me break down those studies that included um, measures of um, brain activity. So most studies um, on arithmetic um, um, has been done with uh, adults and has used functional MRI. Um, and also fMRI, fMRI has been used with children. So there are several studies using fMRI. Um, but I'm not an fMRI person, I'm an EEG person. So of course I, I was interested in what are the uh, uh, fi findings related to EEG. Um, and there um, I found that there are not really that many studies that used EEG or uh, MEG for that matter to investigate arithmetic. Um, and there are uh, many different measures you could uh, uh, derive from EEG. Um, most studies or even all of the studies with children have used event-related potentials, ERPs. Um, I will be talking about a different measure that you could can derive from EEG, um, which is based on uh, 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 taking a look at oscillatory activity, ERD, ERS. What does that this mean, um, ERD, ERS? Um, ERD is the, uh, you know, stands for event-related desynchronization and uh, ERS means event-related synchronization. And it's basically just uh, a the relative uh, change of the band power in a certain activity interval relative to some baseline interval. So it's a really simple, um, simple measure. Um, and we've been using this measure in many studies with adults. Um, yeah, so. One other par parameter we have to set with this method is the frequency band. And there are many frequency bands that you could investigate, but two of the most popular bands are the theta band, four to seven hertz, and the alpha band, eight to 12 hertz. So those two bands have uh, been used in many previous studies with adults. Um, and here's like, um, like a, uh, a representative uh, finding from one of the previous studies with adults. So this is from a, an article by uh, Bert Smet 
um, et al. 2009. And this really uh, highlights the key finding that you can make with EAD ERS. Um, so there are two things to notice from this uh, figure here. Um, EAD ERS is really very sensitive to the strategy that people use to solve a problem. And studies have found, found that in the theta band, so this, this, uh, the theta band is the low frequency band, fact retrieval elicits increased theta ERS for retrieve problems when compared to procedural problems. You can see that uh, in the upper panel here, um, the retrieve problems are the, you know, that's the solid line here. Um, on the y-axis, you can see the amount of ERS or EAD. ERS is positive, EAD is negative numbers. And here, fact retrieval is significantly uh, higher than procedures. And the difference is um, most pronounced in the left hemisphere here. So it's much, much more pronounced here, left in the left hemisphere than in the right hemisphere, okay? And in the other frequency band, the alpha band from eight to 12 Hertz, um, you can also observe, observe significant differences um, between the two strategies. In this case, procedure strategies uh, show much stronger EAD, so that's the other direction, in the negative direction, um, as compared to retrieval. So using EAD ERS in those two frequency bands enables us to um, take a look at you know, the, the brain, um, which tells us um, the strategy that people have been using to solve a given arithmetic problem, okay? Um, we are also interested in the different arithmetic operations. So um, th there have been studies um, uh, on this topic as well. But the problem with um, operations is so when you compare multiplication and subtraction, for example, the problem is that you cannot really compare those directly because they're confounded the strategy, right? Um, so um, any differences that you might uh, find between two different operations might really be due to different strategies. So there are of course are studies that control for operation, but in most of these studies, those operation differences disappear, right? So for example, in, a, uh, in an fMRI study by Brecht et al. 2017, um, which is very similar to what we did, but they used fMRI. They did not find any operation difference uh, between multiplication and subtraction problems. So um, the aims of our study. Um, so we wanted to take a look at those two strategies, retrieval versus procedural problems. Um, we also wanted to um, take into consideration two different operations, multiplication and subtraction. So we chose those two operations from the uh, total of four operations, multiplication and subtraction. Um, and then because um, this is really um, uh, something that was lacking in the literature, um, there, there have been, or we were not aware of uh, any studies that in, involved children in fourth grade. So we, we um, children uh, in, in general, and we selected children in fourth grade um, to look at oscillatory EG activity. So to look at EAT ERS patterns, okay? So our sample, uh, uh, consisted of 31 children in fourth grade, aged between nine and 10 years, 13 female and 18 male. And their task was to solve 80 unique arithmetic problems consisting of 40 subtractions and 40 multiplications. Um, and each of, each of these two um, categories consisted 
of 20 small problems and 20 large problems. What I mean by small and large problems, um, so I just give you some examples. So here's a small subtraction, six minus two, small multiplication, nine times two, whereas a large subtraction could be 26 minus seven and a large multiplication, sorry, <laughs> a large multiplication could be 12 times five. So it's the problem size, the size of the operands and the result that's uh, the distinguishing uh, thing here. So here's the paradigm. So what, 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 what did the did children have to do? Um, well, we uh, measured EEG. So we had a baseline period where they just looked at a dot for 1.5 seconds, and then the problem appeared on the screen. Um, and then they had to compute the solution and uh, verbally responded. So they, once they um, knew the solution, they just um, verbally responded. After that, we asked them which strategy they had used to solve that problem. And we gave them three choices, retrieve, procedure, and I don't know. So individual strategy reports. Um, and that was uh, followed by a blank screen for 1.5 seconds. That was one trial and that repeated uh, 80 times. Here are the results. Um, so solution accuracy was not really surprising. So we expected that from data from adults. You can see that uh, retrieve problems um, are associated with a much higher solution accuracy, so around 98%, when compared to procedural problems, uh, which uh, have an accuracy of only 91%. So that was to be expected. There is no difference uh, between subtraction and multiplication problems. What about response times? Um, that's also something we expected from adult data. Um, obviously, retrieved problems um, were solved much, much faster than procedural problems, okay? So notice that this is a log scaled y axis here. So like this is around two seconds, um, whereas procedural problems, yeah, they're around even around 10, 10 seconds here. Interestingly, so I'd like to draw your attention to these two categories here. So those are retrieved problems for subtractions and multiplications. We don't see any difference here, right? So there's no difference in response times. What about neurophysiological data? So, um, I'm not able to present those uh, nice brain images here because I'm working with EEG. <laughs> so all I can present is those uh, colored dots here, but um, hopefully that's, this is going to be as interesting. Um, here, um, I'm showing you the results for the theta and you remember theta is associated with uh, increased ERS for retrieved problems. And that's what we can observe here in this plot as well. If you take a look here, those are the retrieve problems here and they elicit higher ERS than the procedural problems on this side here. And this is significant, the difference. But the interesting finding, and that was the surprising finding but that we didn't expect is this one here. So the difference between, between retrieved subtractions and retrieved multiplications is also significant. We didn't expect that. So both operations are retrieved, but apparently retrieved multiplications show an even higher theta ERS than retrieved subtractions shown here. There is also an effect of topography, um, which basically replicates the results from adult studies. I just wanna um, highlight what I said or what I mentioned in the introduction, um, namely that the difference, the strategy difference um, is most pronoun pronounced in the theta band here in the left parietal occipital um, region. So the difference here, that's the, the biggest difference basically. That's to be expected. 
Um, yeah, we also took a look at the alpha band. Remember, um, in the alpha band, we expected to see increased EAD, so going in, into the negative direction for procedures um, as compared to retrieval. And that's what we see here also, but it's not that pronounced really. So the effect size is much, much smaller, but still you can see that um, we get the expected effect. All right, um, that brings me to the discussion of, uh, of our results, um, our summary. So the patterns we, we found in fourth graders are really similar to those that we, or many studies found in adults, which um, means retrieval is faster and more accurate than procedures. Um, and also retrieval shows the theta ERS and procedures show alpha ERD. So that was all expected. And um, we could show that um, children in fourth grade also exhibit these patterns, okay? But what we did not expect was that there was a difference, a neuro neurophysiological difference um, within retrieved problems. So only within retrieved problems, we saw that retrieved multiplications had, were associated with even higher theta ERS than retrieved subtractions, right? Even though, and that is the key, the key thing, even though there is no behavioral difference. So remember response times were identical basically, okay? Um, yeah, and we didn't, we didn't find uh, any operation difference in the other strategy, in the procedural strategy, just in the retrieval strategy. What are the possible interpretations of, the, uh, of this uh, finding? Well, we came up with two explanations. First, um, the first explanation, um, it might be the case that uh, children solved at least some subtractions that are reported as retrieved with a procedure, right? So this might be an unconscious process. Maybe it's a very fast procedure so that they reported it as retrieved. And this will lead exactly to those EAD patterns that we observed. So this would be one explanation. Um, the other explanation shown here um, could be that what we actually observed is that multiplication facts of different operations so of multiplication and of subtraction are actually stored and retrieved in different networks. Um, there is some prior literature that supports this claim or this interpretation, um, sort of some evidence for that. Um, and this would really be the first time that uh, someone was able to show that with uh, EEG or with, uh, yeah, with EEG or even EAD ARS. Um, so if you're interested in this study, there's uh, already a preprint out there available um, uh, here. Uh, we will make all the data and analysis scripts available as well. That would be available soon. If you're interested, you can go check out and reproduce all of our analyses. Uh, next slide, no, I skipped one slide. Yeah, uh, you can, uh, so here are some ways you can contact me if you're interested um, and have some more questions. And yeah, finally, I would like to thank my collaborators. Um, slide is not coming up, let's see. <laughs> oh yeah, here, here they are. So I would like to thank my collaborators and of course you, you for your attention, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Brenner, for this uh, great talk. So any questions for Dr. Brenner, you can either type in the chat or uh, unmute yourself. Very interesting talk. I thought that was very uh, exciting uh, results. I just have a question if you could speak a little bit to uh, the way in which these children uh, learn multiplication in school, whether I know there might be some explanations that um, unlike subtraction, maybe those multiplication facts are from the get-go uh, taught in a way that um, emphasizes retrieval strategies. 
versus the subtraction problems just over time being consolidated and stored in memory. So I'm just wondering if you could say a little bit more about kind of the yeah. educational background of these kids. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's a very good point. Um, and it uh, relates to, let's see, yeah, to the, to the second explanation here. Uh, you're absolutely right. Um, I think in most countries, um, children uh, learn multiplication tables by heart, basically. So they um, le learn those problems by rote. Um, you don't even have to have a sense of magnitude or something. You don't really compute them, but you just learn them by heart, right? Um, and that is certainly influencing um, how those facts are stored. Um, whereas subtractions are never really practiced that way. So um, no one, I think, um, here and um, um, anywhere learns subtraction like we learn multiplications. Um, and that would certainly be very much in line with this explanation. So, which means that either um, multiplication facts and subtraction facts, because their learning history is so different, are then stored in a very different way, um, in a very distinct way in the brain. And the, which means that also retrieving um, those two facts, that, 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 that's a process or the those are two different processes that we can distinguish. Um, or another explanation would even be, and there are um, theories or hypotheses that this might be the case, that subtractions are never really actually facts, but they are just so, um, um, so uh, practiced so much that the procedure to compute those uh, results they get really, they get compacted, but they stay a, a procedure um, that gets so fast that um, children report, not even children, also adults, of course, report the, um, the solution um, as a fact retrieval. And yeah, so this would also speak uh, for the first uh, interpretation here. So maybe it's a mix of both. Any other questions for Dr. Brenner? Okay, so I don't see any questions in the chat. So if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to email Dr. Press, Dr. Brenner, or me. Uh, very, very happy to answer any, any questions you may have. So I would like to say thank you again to our two great presenters, Dr. Press and Dr. Brenner. And thank you so much for presenting your work. And uh, I, would also, I would also like to thank everyone uh, who come to the symposium. So um, yeah, so uh, let's stop here. It's 12 o'clock. So uh, uh, have a great weekend, everyone. Thank you, everyone. See you all next week. Thank you. I guess. Bye. -bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye. See you.